Today we're beginning a new series. And the title of this series is Faith Shakers. And what we're going to be doing in this series is, well, just like the, the title says, we're going to be looking at some things that many times will rattle, will really shake our faith. Maybe pull us away from God or, or maybe even cause us to doubt God. This week I had some, some startling news. I got a call. Julie uh, was in the car with me and uh, one of the members from Robert Cell, Brian Johnson, called. And a lady that I baptized, her name was Angela. She's probably somewhere in her 40s, maybe early 50s. They came home and she had passed away. She was dead. And, and I don't know all the details as, uh, as to what took place. She had been battling health problems for several years. But she was just a, a sweet individual. And, and I'll never forget the day that we left, our, our last Sunday at Robert's Hill, she just came up and she was crying in my arms and she just kept saying over and over again, I love you and your, you and your family. You mean so much, you and, and your family. And you know, you, you look at, at someone like that and it causes you to ask a question. Why do bad things happen to good people? How many of you have ever asked that question, or maybe you know someone that's asked that question? You, you've heard it being asked. Look around. I, I think all of us have at, at times. Why, why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, God, you, you just don't seem fair. You know, really... We're not the only ones to ask that question. I mean, you can go as far back as Abraham. And Scripture records in Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, Abraham asking this question, should not the judge of the world judge fairly? In other words, hey God, aren't you, aren't you supposed to be fair? You go over to Psalm chapter 73, verses 3 through 5, and, and we find... David questioning. He says, I saw the wicked people doing well. They are not suffering. They're healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like the rest of us. They don't have problems like other people. Then you get into verses 12 through 13. He goes on. He says, These people are wicked. In other words, he's crying out to God, always at ease, and, and they're just getting richer. And so he begins to question. He says, So why have I kept my heart pure? You know, why have I kept my hands from, from doing wrong? I mean, God, I'm looking around, and you know, you, you just don't seem fair. I mean, here's all these wicked people, and, and they seem to be prospering. They, they seem to be doing well. You know, I, I don't understand, God, why, why I'm trying to, to live the righteous life. If these are the people who are prospering. But then David goes on to say in verses 21 through 22, basically it's his apologies to God. He says, God, I'm, I'm sorry. He said, I, I looked around and, and I was just angry. And he said, my thinking, it was, it was senseless. And it was, it was stupid. But, but David, he, he questioned. Then we get over into Jeremiah, and, and we see Jeremiah doing the same thing, same question. God, why do, why do the wicked prosper? In other words, God, it's, it's just not fair. Why are evil people so happy? And we find Habakkuk doing something similar. He says to God, God, why do you make me look at injustice? There's injustice in the world. Why do you tolerate this? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are, are before me. There's strife and, and contention abounds. In other words, God, you just don't seem fair. We might ask that question a little bit differently. God, why are there so many children in other countries starving to death? 
Or, or God, why are there so many innocent people in, in other countries that are dying of diseases every day that, you know, we in America, we, we have cures for? Or, or God, you know, the, these tornadoes and tsunamis and, and hurricanes, you know, that, that just, you know, wipes people out. Innocent people. God, it just doesn't seem fair. But you know, really, over my 20 years of ministry, I would say most of us are not saying, God, why is all this happening to them? Why is this happening to all those people? I, I think the question that most people ask is, God, why are these things happening to me? God, why, why is this happening to, to my loved ones? In, in other words, for most people, this is a very personal question. It was for me. As I've told you not too long ago, Julie and I, we lost our first child. And, and after we, we lost our, our, our baby, I, I just remember asking myself, and, and I know Julie and I, we talked about this, and, and I don't know if she questioned as much as I did, but, but I wanted to know, God, why? Why do I look around and, and over here is a family that didn't want to get pregnant. They got pregnant out of wedlock and they didn't even want the child. And, and God, over here is another family and, and they're doing drugs and, and their baby, it, it came out healthy. And, and God, here's a family over here and, and they had a baby and, and God, they're not even taking care of those kids. They don't care anything about those kids. But here I am, God, I'm a Christian and I serve you. And my child dies. Why? And that may be where some of you are right now. You're, you're just questioning, God, why? Why did you let me get abused? When I was a child, why, why did you let him or her do that to me? Or, or God, why did our marriage fall apart? I mean, all I wanted was, was a good, strong marriage. Or, or God, why, why haven't I been able to find someone to, to marry? All my friends, they're gone and they're married. And, and I just don't understand, God, as, as a Christian serving you, and, and I can't find anyone. Or God, why, why does my father or my mother have cancer? Or God, why is my child born with this rare condition? Or why did I get laid off from my job when I'm the hardest worker there? Or God, why can't I get ahead? I try so hard, and then all of a sudden something breaks. And we're right back where we started. God, you just don't seem fair. And you know, I really believe that for the most part, most of us, we want to give God the benefit of the doubt, right? I mean, deep down inside, we, we want to believe, you know, that, that God is an awesome God and that God is, is, is a good God and He's in control but if God is in control, if God is a good guide, it's almost like we, we're, we're forced into this corner to where we have to ask the question, okay, then, then God, if you're good and you're in control, then why'd you allow this to happen to me? And we begin to question whether we can trust God or, or maybe we even begin to doubt that God even exists. God just doesn't seem fair. And that's what I want us to, to talk about this morning. And really, before I start throwing out some things, I want you to know this is not going to be one of those lessons where I give you three points and you walk out of here going, oh man, I've, I've got all the answers now. Man, let's go do some lunch. I feel so much better now. It's not going to be that kind of lesson. Because I, I can't answer all the questions that you may have. 
But what I can do this morning is, is I can share with you some very biblical, very possible reasons as to why bad things happen to good people. Very biblical reasons as to why bad things many times happen to, to you and me. And, and hopefully, by the end of this lesson, hopefully your faith will be strengthened instead of down the road being shattered or shaken. But let's begin with this point. Why, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, maybe it's because we're a victim of a broken world. You know, you go into Genesis chapters one and Genesis chapters one through three, and we begin to see that God has created the world and everything is good, right? And everything is perfect, but then Adam and Eve they sin, and sin enters the world. And with it comes punishment, and consequences, and curses. For example, having babies, ladies, became painful. Also, the ground became cursed. Because of sin, there's sickness, there's death, there's pain. That's why Jesus says, in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, In this world you will have what? Trouble. And, and Jesus is just, he, he's, he's being real. He, he's not painting this world as we many times see it through rose tinted glasses. Man, everything's going to be wonderful. If you'll just become a Christian, then everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be perfect. No, Jesus. Man, he, he puts it out there. He's very real. In this world, you will, not you might, but He says you will have trouble. But I love the conclusion. He says, but take heart. He says, I have overcome the world. We're going to talk more about that in just a few minutes. You see, we need to acknowledge that some of the bad things that may happen to us are just a result of living in a sinful world. Something else we might want to think about, and, and really this is not a, a point that I even like to mention, but it may be that bad things happen to us because we brought them on ourselves. You say, well, Slate, what do you mean? Well, we talked about this not too long ago, that God has given us the freedom to choose. And many times we even question that, and we question God's love through that. Why, God, why didn't God make me a robot? Because He loves us so much. God wants us to choose Him. He doesn't force us into that relationship. He doesn't force us to live a certain way. He, he, just, he, he loves us so much that He says, you know what, I, I'm going to give you the chance to choose me. And sometimes we end up making poor decisions. Sometimes we choose to act carelessly or, or thoughtlessly. I mean, really, that's most accidents, right? I mean, they're, they're due to, to carelessness or, or thoughtlessness. If, if that person involved in that accident had only been more alert, if they had only been more cautious, if they hadn't been texting, and you know, that's the big law in Florida right now, don't text and, and drive. If that individual had been more thought, thoughtful, more, more careful, and maybe that wouldn't have happened. If they had just, you know, made sure that the gun was on safety. You know, whatever the, the case may be, sometimes we, we just act thoughtlessly, carelessly, and, and bad things are the result. Sometimes we also act out of ignorance. And when we do that, we often suffer. In, in fact, um, you know, not too long ago, well, I would say several years ago, Liesl was very small. And she had an ear infection, and we took her to the doctor, and 
the, the doctor said, yeah, she's got this infection. We're, we're going to put her on penicillin. And so they, they put her on penicillin, and all of a sudden, whelps, I'm telling you, bigger than softballs began to show up all over her body. And she was just blazing with fever, and she was just lifeless. And, and, and we took her back to the doctor, and, and they said, oh no, she's, she's had an allergic reaction to the penicillin. And the doctor said, the bad thing is, what you see on the outside is bad, but what's going on on the inside is even worse. And she said, you know what, the, the next time, Lord willing, there won't be a next time, but if, if Liesl were to get a hold of penicillin again, as bad as this would, it could kill her. But you know, the, the doctor didn't do that on purpose, and we didn't give that to, to Liesl on purpose, just out of ignorance, you know, not knowing any better, knowing how she was going to, to respond to the medicine, something bad happened. Also, we're, we're free to, to act deceitfully and maliciously. We do that sometimes. Cain maliciously murdered his brother Abel in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 15, which caused him a lifetime of grief and trouble. Think about Jacob and how Jacob deceitfully, you know, took his brother's birthright. And, and man, when Esau found out about it, he became angry and it damaged their, their relationship. And and, and Jacob was forced to leave his mom and his dad, and he goes to, to his uncle Laban's house, and, and there, you know, he gets in all kind of trouble with his uncle. His uncle also deceives him. Also think about David, who acted deceitfully and maliciously when he killed Uriah. And in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 14 through 21, you know, we, we read about how David worked to get Uriah killed. And, and then later on, we see David asking for forgiveness. And God forgave David, yes, but he still had to suffer for the mistake that he made, along with others. You see, a lot of the evil in the world today is because people choose to be vicious and, and mean. And a lot of people suffer because of that. You, you think of a lot of the, the school shootings. Or you think about what took place in Colorado uh, a while back where a guy, a gunsman, walks into a movie theater and, and just starts shooting. And so you have the consequences of sinful behavior, not just for the individual, but for others as well. But there are consequences. Listen to Psalm chapter 32, verse 10. The psalmist puts it like this, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. But many sorrows shall be to the wicked. And I just want to throw an example out of how our, our sinful behavior can really uh, cause us a lot of pain and, and suffering. Let's say you go to a party and you drink and you get drunk. And, and you get behind the, the wheel of a vehicle and you're driving home and maybe you're pulled over by a policeman and you know they take you to jail, they take your license, or maybe you're driving and you hit someone like what happened at Robertsdale to, to one of our ladies, her her husband, or not her husband, but her son was a preacher and he was hit by a drunk driver and he was killed. We know better than to look up at God and say, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Right? I mean, we know better than to say, God, why did you, why did you allow the police to take my license? Why, why did you, you know, uh, allow me to, to go to jail? We know better than that. We made the choices that led to our suffering and, and our downfall. I think about Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 8, where Paul writes, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. 
He says, a man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, notice what you get in return. From the flesh, you will reap what? Destruction. And so you reap what you sow. It's this idea, okay, we get to choose, but through the choices we make, many times those lead to destruction, or he goes on to say, whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And that kind of goes back to what David Barton was saying as he was making reference to the Lord's Supper this morning. We have choices. But sometimes our choices calls us to suffer and even calls others to suffer. But let me mention something else, and, and maybe you can draw encouragement from this next point. It's kind of a, a change, it's kind of different. Maybe God wants to do something big. You know, you, you look at John chapter 9, and you see the story of this, this blind man. And don't you know, if you were blind, you would have a lot of questions, right? I mean, you would be questioning, okay, God, why me? I mean, why not my brother? Why not my sister? Why not this, this guy, this bully over here? Or this individual that's, that's cheating someone over here? God, why, why did you allow me to be made blind? That's the question that the disciples had in that same chapter, right? They're passing this blind man, and they just look at Jesus. They said, why? You know, was it something that, that he did? Was it some sort of sin that his parents committed? And you remember what Jesus said, verse 3. He says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He says, but this happened, why? So that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, the very thing that this blind man probably didn't understand, this, the very thing that this blind man probably didn't want, the, the very thing that was so hard on him was actually the work of God. And through that work, God was displayed and given glory. I mean, you, you think about this story. And you think about when Jesus heals this blind man. He's got a story now that will change lives forever. What happened to you? I thought you were blind. I was. But Jesus healed me. And some of you have got an amazing story. I think about Joseph in, in the Old Testament. Remember Joseph, man, you talk about bad. He was... Betrayed by his brothers. He was thrown into a pit because they were so jealous of him. And then they sold him into slavery. And while in slavery, Potiphar's wife lies about him and he ends up in prison. Then while in prison, he interprets a dream for a guy and he tells him, look, when you get out, remember me. Tell Pharaoh about me. And the guy is released and he gets out. And for two years, the guy forgets about him. Man, don't you know if there was anybody who could say, God, why? Man, I have served you. I have been faithful to you. It was Joseph. But as you look at his life, you begin to see God do something big. Because two years later, Pharaoh has a dream and he can't figure it out. And, and so the butler who had been in jail with, with Joseph, was supposed to remember him, finally says, hey, oh yeah, hey, I know somebody who can help you with this. And so Pharaoh sends for Joseph, and, and he tells Joseph his dream, and Joseph says, listen, I can't tell you what this dream means, but God can. He's telling this to a guy that probably worshipped all kinds of idols and, and false God, and now Joseph has an opportunity to point to the one true God. 
But then even beyond that, Joseph said, listen, here's what God says your dream means. There's going to be seven bad years, or seven good years rather, and there's just going to be this abundance where you're going to have more than you know what to do with, and then there are going to be seven bad years, seven years of famine. And so what God wants you to do is store up for those seven good years to take care of the seven bad years. And Pharaoh says, well, you know what? You've got this connection with God. You're the man, and now he is placed under second in command under Pharaoh over all Egypt. And the story gets even better. Seven good years, Joseph stored away, then the seven bad years come and there's famine. And Joseph's brothers, the one that sold him into slavery, they come to Egypt because they hear Egypt has got food. And so they come to Egypt and now Joseph is able to provide for his family. He's able to provide for God's people. In fact, his brothers, when they figure out it's him, they said, oh, Joseph, we're so sorry. We, we were so mean. We were terrible. And I love Joseph's response. He says, what you meant for evil, listen to this. Listen to what Joseph says. God used for good. God did something big. And of course, you know through that lineage, you have the twelve tribes and the children of Israel until it comes to Christ, our Savior. God did something big. Now, now listen, I'm not trying to belittle anyone's pain and say, listen, this is the reason why you're suffering. I don't even want to go there because I know for some of you, it's, it's Friday. You say, well, Slate, what do you mean it's, it's Friday? Well, if you remember on that Friday... Jesus died. Man, the disciples, they were so upset. They didn't understand. This was terrible. I can't, you know, I can't believe this is happening. What is God, you know, what is God doing here? This, this doesn't seem fair. I mean, all of their hopes and their dreams were, were, were gone. They were nailed to a cross. And maybe that's where some of you are right now. It's Friday and you don't, you don't know what's, what's going to happen next. You don't know what God's going to do. And I'm not telling you that God's going to do this and God's going to do that and it's going to be, you know, this, this fairy tale ending. But I am saying that it may be Friday for you, it may be dark, but Sunday's just around the corner. And one day you may realize that it, was, that it actually took a death in order for there to be a resurrection. I'm just saying that maybe, maybe God one day will do something big through the thing that right now you don't understand. Right now you wish would never happen. Maybe. Just maybe. But what I do know for sure is this. God is doing something in you and me. You can bank on it. You know, there, there's a verse that's really annoying, but just because it's annoying doesn't mean that it's not true. James says in James chapter 1, verses 22, 20, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Isn't that annoying? Doesn't that disturb you? Joy, I, I, I can have joy in the face of trials. You know, during, during hard times, how is that? Why, why should that be? And he goes on to say, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. In other words, because it's, it's doing something in you. One of the attitudes that I've tried to develop over the years is I'll, I'll have people will come up to me and they'll say, man, this is going on, this is going on, and, and you know, I'm just, oh, things are terrible. And my, my response now, I, because I really don't know what else to say, but I do know this, is I'll just look them in the face and say, man, God must be doing something really big in you right now. Here's something I know about every single one of you. If you live long enough, you're going to go through something bad. 
Something you're not going to like. Something you're not going to understand. But just maybe over time, you'll be able to look back and say, you know, I wouldn't have chosen that, and I definitely wouldn't want to go through that again, but it made me different. It made me better. It made me stronger. For some of you, you may say, man, it drew me closer to God. For others of you, you may say, man, I was at the lowest point, and it was when I finally hit the bottom that I began to look up, and God saved me. There's a family at Robertsdale. And I hope y'all don't mind me going back and telling the, some of these stories. I was there for 14 years, so. Got a lot of stories to tell. But there was a family, and her name was Mary Ryan, and I would go and visit her mother. Her mother had bad health issues. And Mary Ryan had left the church. Um, she, she grew up. Uh, going to church with her mom, but someone said something negative to her, I think, at church. She had a bad experience, and from that point on, she said, you know what, I'm not going back. And so when I'd go and visit her mom, I'd also try and reason with her and talk to her, man, we'd love to have you come back, and she just, nah, not interested. Well, Mary, Mary Ryan had her second baby, and it was a girl, her name was Chesney. And she, one morning, laid Chesney on her back on the, the floor, and she went to check on her son, who was in the bathtub. And when she came back, Chesney somehow, even as little as she was, had rolled over, and she died. Sids. Man, she was just heartbroken. But it was at that point that Mary Ryan began to search for God in our life again. And through that, I was able to set up a series of studies and ended up baptizing her. And then um, several months later, I ended up baptizing her husband, Justin. And man, what an asset both of them are to the church at Robert still now. I'm not telling you that to say that you know, after they came to Christ, that everything was perfect, that they didn't hurt, that they didn't experience pain, and that they still don't suffer from their loss. But there's one thing that I've heard them say time and time through tears. It's through Chesney's death. We have life. We've been saved. Because it was during her death that we began to search God out. And we drew closer to Him. And it's just amazing to see this couple praise God. Even in the loss of a child. You know, the question so many people ask, why do bad things happen to good people, is really a flawed question. And the reason it's flawed is because te technically there's, there's not a good person. You say, no, wait a second, Slade, I'm, I'm a good person. No, no, you're not. Neither am I. We looked at this last week, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All of us are sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Remember that sin it separates us. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, from from God. And many times we'll try and build a bridge back to God, but we fall short. And so God had to build this bridge through His Son. But in Romans chapter 3, verse 12, if you back up, it says, there is no one that does good. Not even one. And the reason that's important is until we see ourselves as sinners, we're not going to be able to see how good God really is. Because we're sinners, we were, as David pointed out earlier, we were objects of His wrath. But God sent His only begotten Son to become sin for us and to die on a cross so that our terrible sins could be forgiven so that we could have a relationship with Him. As I said, we couldn't build that bridge back. Only God could, and so He sent His Son. 
And so when people say, you know what, God's just not fair. You know what, I agree with him 100%. God's not fair. If he was, he would give us what our sins deserve. Instead, God is a God of grace. And he gives us what we need. I love the saying, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. How true that is. I'm going to go ahead and extend the invitation this morning. For those of you that may not be in Christ, let me tell you something. This world's not going to be a bed of roses, but it is so much better going through this life with the Father. And this morning, if you want to, to come to Jesus, baptize, into Christ, into His death, His blood today. You can have all your sins completely washed away. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And God says, if you'll, if you'll draw close to Me, I'll draw close to you. Today, draw, draw to Him. Come to Him. He's standing at the door knocking. Or today, if you are a Christian, but you've fallen away. And, and maybe right now, you just need, you need prayers. Prayers for your faith that instead of allowing Satan to come in and, and just pull the rug out from under you and cause you to question and doubt God, that you will have a solid faith believing and trusting that God is in control and He is so good and that He truly loves you. But if you need to come, won't you come as together we stand as we sing?